This video has been made with the purpose of education and awareness of real crimes and there is no disrespect intended to anyone. This is to help promote truth and justice for anyone who has been a victim of crime. What I'm about to report is what I have researched online and I will welcome any corrections should they be required. Hey there little berry true crime fans and new berries who are my lovely new members. Thank you very, very much for returning to another video with me. I will give trigger warnings right from the beginning. This is horrific. This is a case of severe ritual abuse of a little child. And this boy died a horrible death. If you don't want to hear this type of story, I can completely understand. Please click off. This is the case of Dennis Craig Jurgens. I first heard of this case when I was 12. I was on holiday and it was one of those evenings where I just didn't want to go out and do anything, so I watched telly with my mum. And one of the films that came on, it was a TV film, so it wasn't like it was in the cinemas or anything, and it was called A Child Lost Forever. It said this is based on a true story. I saw that nearly 28 years ago. Only a few months back, I was thinking, my God, what was that all about? So all I could remember was the boy's first name, Dennis. And I thought, I do have to cover this. There are images and videos online of the autopsy. Also images and video of the boy's exhumed body. I wouldn't recommend looking for them. They're very, very hard to see. But um, I'm not going to include them on this video because they are very, very upsetting. Jerry Ann Puckett hadn't had an easy life. Her mother abandoned her when she was three years old and so she was raised by her father. Her father remarried twice and both these stepmothers were abusive physically and verbally towards Jerry and she decided to just rebel. You know, she ran away several times. She got into things like smoking, bunking off school, and she was deemed to be incorrigible. So deciding he'd had enough, Jerry's father had her placed into foster care. Jerry was abandoned and let down by so many people in her life. First her mother for leaving her, her father for just not giving a crap, you know, allowing her to be abused by two stepmothers and just washing his hands of her when she was a bit, a bit trouble. I'm afraid that is part of raising kids. Some will be more of a handful than others. Jerry didn't fare so well in foster care and she ran away a few times. She was placed into a home for girls, the Sork Center Reform School in Minnesota. She was originally from Maryville in Missouri, so this was a way away from where her father lived. And I think part of it was to keep her from going back. At one point, she was sent away from the school and into foster care again. But when she was 16, she met and fell in love with 18-year-old Dennis McIntyre. They were so besotted with each other. They genuinely loved each other. They planned on being together once they were able. They began a sexual relationship. And once the foster home found out, they sent Jerry back to the school. However, upon her return, Jerry was two months pregnant. Her father had relinquished all of his parental rights. He had no responsibility for her at all. So essentially she was made a ward of the state. On the 6th of December in 1961, Jerry gave birth to a healthy baby boy weighing eight and a half pounds. She named him after the boy's father, Dennis. However, as Jerry and Dennis McIntyre weren't married, baby Dennis was given his mother's last name. The little boy was baptised Dennis Craig Puckett. Although a Protestant, Jerry had expressed desire to convert to Catholicism as this was Dennis McIntyre's religion, so she baptised the baby Dennis into the Catholic faith. Jerry adored her little boy, as did Dennis McIntyre. They were so besotted with him. Jerry was adamant, even though she was a ward of the state, she was 17, she wanted to keep him and raise him with her boyfriend. However, Jerry was pressured by the school and by the authorities to give little Dennis up for adoption. With much reluctance, Jerry agreed to sign over her parental rights. She was heartbroken, but she was determined that as soon as her baby reached adulthood that they would meet again. Jerry was with her baby boy only around two weeks. Not long after giving birth to little Dennis, Jerry actually fell pregnant again by Dennis McIntyre. This time she gave birth to a daughter whom she named Misty. At the time of Misty's birth, 
Jerry was still at the school, still a ward of the state. She was around 18 here. But Jerry was determined not to let any more of her children go. Although Misty was briefly put into foster care, Jerry eventually did get her back. And in June in 1963, she and Dennis McIntyre took Misty. They married. And over the next four years, they had four children in total. As well as Misty, they had two more daughters, Rhonda and Dawn, and they had a little boy. Jerry also named this little boy Dennis Craig. Dennis McIntyre was a carpenter, and Jerry worked odd jobs to support the children. So by the age of 23, Jerry had given birth five times, and she had four children living with her. The marriage to Dennis Sr. didn't last. After nine years of marriage, they divorced and Jerry went on to marry again a man called Richard Sherwood. This also ended in divorce. Jerry described at times raising the children on her own was very hard. They often didn't have a lot of money but Jerry and Dennis did their best to raise their children and make sure that they were raised to appreciate what they had and these kids adored their mother. However Jerry never got over the fact that her firstborn baby had been taken from her and she held on to the belief again that they would meet again. So each year at Dennis's birthday on the 6th of December, she would light a candle and sing happy birthday. She would fall into a depression at each time of that year. But after Dennis's 18th birthday pass, Jerry's hope for a reunion increased and she couldn't wait to hear from him. She thought she'd give him at least a year to make a decision himself as to whether he wanted to find his birth mother. But Jerry didn't hear from him. Jerry was very concerned that the possibility that Dennis didn't want to know her, and that would have been his right. But Jerry needed that closure, so as Dennis's 19th birthday passed, Jerry decided she would reach out herself, and so she called the authorities. A few weeks later, Jerry receives a letter, opening it with anxious anticipation. Did Dennis want to see her, or did he not? Jerry's heart broke as soon as she read these following words. We are sorry to inform you that Dennis Craig Jurgens died on April 11th, 1965 of peritonitis. Peritonitis is an infection of the peritoneum, which is the lining of the bowel. The letter mentioned that he died as a result of a fall that caused this infection. Jerry cried for three days straight. She'd gone through 19 years believing that her son was alive and well. It never even crossed her mind that her son may no longer be living, and he died in infancy at three and a half, and she'd never been told. Jerry found out that Dennis had been buried in White Bear Lake in a place called St. Mary's Cemetery, and wanting to say goodbye properly, Jerry went there with her son, her daughter, and a friend. They went row by row to find the grave of Dennis, but they couldn't find it. So Jerry went to the mortuary where Dennis's funeral had been held, where his body had been prepared. And the attendant there, his name was Jim, was actually the man who had prepared Dennis's body 16 years prior. He'd been there for a few decades and he vividly remembered little Dennis. Jim pulled a file and a clipping from a newspaper article and it was titled Tot's death due to peritonitis, it said the following. An autopsy on the body of three and a half year old Dennis Jurgens, of Mr. and Mrs. Harold R. Jurgens, 2148 South Gardnet Drive, White Bear Lake, showed he died of peritonitis caused by a ruptured bowel. Dr. Thomas W. Votel, Ramsey County Coroner, said today. However, it was the next sentence that shocked Jerry Sherwood. The body also bore multiple injuries and bruises, Dr. Votel said. Jerry saw from the rest of the article that there was an active investigation into Dennis's death, so she went to find out what the conclusion of that investigation was. The fact that it mentioned these bruises and injuries, it didn't sit right with her. She looked at her children, her friend, and said, they beat my baby to death. It was just a gut feeling. Jerry and the people with her went back to the graveyard and they saw that there was a man tending to the graves. They asked him if he knew where Dennis Craig Jurgens' grave was. He knew exactly where it was, but he revealed he was actually the boy's uncle. He was the brother 
of the adoptive mother. This man took Jerry to the location where the little boy was buried. It was a flat stone in the grass and it would have been easily missed for there was grass growing around it, there were no flowers. And the writing said, our little angel, then his name, Dennis C. Jurgens, December 6th, 1961 to April 11th, 1965. The uncle told Jerry that the mother's name was Lois Jurgens. He said she was very, very good to him, gave him everything that he would have wanted. And then Jerry revealed, I'm the boy's birth mother. The man continued to say how great his sister was with the little boy. But when Jerry said there was an article that mentioned bruises and injuries, the man didn't say anything. He just turned and walked away. The man whom Jerry had encountered was called Jerome, Jerome Zerwas. He was a former police officer, a high-ranking police, police officer, who now worked at St. Mary's Cemetery. He had also told Jerry where Harold, who was Dennis's adoptive father, worked, and through this contact, Jerry was able to obtain the Jurgens' home telephone number. Jerry called the number. It was answered by Lois Jurgens. Jerry introduced herself. Lois was amazed and shocked that Jerry was only just finding out now that little Dennis had died. She honestly believed that Jerry had been told all those years before. Jerry asked what Dennis was like. Lois told that he was such a good little boy, very, very cute. When Jerry asked about injuries and bruises, Lois said that the body had blotches on it, black blotches, but she didn't know how he'd got them possibly from the peritonitis. Lois agreed to post to Jerry a picture of Dennis and the baptismal gown that Jerry had wrapped him in when she had him baptised. Jerry gave her name, her number and her address to Lois. She waited six weeks, nothing. Jerry called the Jurgens back, but the number was gone. It didn't exist anymore. She tried to find the new number and it turned out it was unlisted. Lois had not made good on her promise and had changed the number so that Jerry wouldn't be able to get in touch again. This only fueled Jerry's suspicion that something was wrong. People kept saying to her, look, let it go. He's gone, you can't bring him back. You know now where he is. You relinquished your, your rights, get on with your life. So she did. She tried for a long time, but she couldn't ignore that gut feeling that something was wrong, that something told her that little Dennis had met with foul play, that his death was not just an infection, that something happened to him that caused it. When Jerry signed away her parental rights, she was given the assurance that the little boy would be taken care of, whoever they placed him with, would give him what she couldn't. And they even said there was a family lined up, which actually turned out not to be true. Jerry later remarked that yes, he was given something she couldn't give him. They gave him death. She had raised four children. They'd had it rough, but they were alive. After a few years, this gut feeling just festered and Jerry decided once and for all that she was gonna find out what happened to her little boy. She was going to get justice for him if he had met with foul play. Yes, Jerry had had it rough through her life, but she was kind, caring, and had the most incredible motherly instinct to protect her own. And she was determined, more than anything, to get justice for what she believed to be the murder of her son. Lois Jurgens had 15 siblings, and those that were surviving at the time of this incident had their own children. Lois had aunts and uncles and cousins, so it was a huge family. Lois and Harold Jurgens moved into 2148 South Gardnet Drive in 1957, when they were 31 and 35, respectively. Lois was a housewife and Harold was an electrician. Lois was from a large family and they were impoverished. If you can imagine, 16 kids, even half that would be considered a huge family. Lois longed to increase her social standing. Lois Zerwas, which was her maiden name, was born on the 12th of August in 1925 and she was the fourth of the 16 siblings. 
As a teenager, she was extremely attractive, very flirtatious, outgoing, bubbly, and she was fully aware of how good she looked. She was obsessive about her looks and charms. But many people said that at some point, that vivacious, bright, bubbly personality faded. Somehow out came an angry, spiteful, a nasty personality. It was at a dance when she was 15 years old that she met Harold Jurgens, who was actually a musician. He was an only child, so complete opposite to, to Lois, and he was from a wealthy family, a wealthy upper class family. The patriarch of the Zerwos family, John Zerwos, was an alcoholic. He rarely held down a job. They lived in both Minnesota and in North Dakota. They moved all the time, frequently, to farms, and they live with other families at certain times. John Zerwas did some odd things. He would burn his arm hair with a cigarette lighter. He would pick up random things in the countryside to sell or to use. Uh, but when the children were old enough to work, they were pulled out of school and they went out to work and gave most of their wages to their parents. Lois was taken out of school in the eighth grade, and she was taken out of school not to work, but to help out at home. John Zerwas was a tyrant, ruled his family with an iron fist. He would beat his children for the most minor of infractions or what he considered to be infractions. He, was, he had very specific views on roles according to gender. And he had a, a way of using both beatings and his words, children and his wife, to instill in them the importance of falling in line. One example was that at one point when Lois was in her teens, she was ironing, and when she left it because she felt tired, she wanted to sit down, her father beat her severely, telling her it was her duty to iron, to get back to it and do it. But instead of rebelling against this behavior, like a lot of people do, Lois and some of her siblings had the opposite reaction to what their father did. Lois specifically said that everyone, every kid in that family, got what they deserved if they were punished. If they didn't do what they were told, if they didn't follow orders, if they didn't do exactly what they were supposed to, they deserved anything they got. And Lois actually agreed with the beating she received from her father. She says she deserved discipline, so she knew her place. The level of control that her father had over Lois filtered through to her own desire to control her entire world. As she got up into her adult years, she wanted everyone around her to do what she wanted, to conform to what she wanted. And it also meant that she became very conscientious about cleanliness and neatness. Occasionally though, Lois did call the police on her father when he would beat their mother, but in turn, she would receive a beating for doing that. As the Zerwas children grew up, they started their own families. They gained a reputation in White Bear Lake for being unruly, disruptive. And if anyone called the police on their children for being antisocial, the Zerwas would retaliate with counter complaints. They were a force to be reckoned with. Harold Jurgens, by contrast, was a quiet, unassuming person, didn't draw much attention to himself. Yes, he had been an only child, but his mother had also been quite overbearing with him, quite overprotective of him. Both before and after marrying Lois on the 31st of January 1944, Harold Jurgens moved around, tried different career paths before finally becoming an electrician. Lois and her siblings would have almost weekly get-togethers at their parents' house. They would bring their own children, and then friends of the children would come along, and friends of the siblings, and then uncles, aunts. It was a massive get together and they would do it regularly. They would have things like, uh, they would hire marquees or they would have events. Lois was not popular among her siblings. For the most part, she was domineering, scary, and got angry and uptight over the smallest things. She would pick arguments with people. Now, this was a big family. People did end up, you know, having arguments and sometimes physical fights, but they would make up. Sometimes Lois was the life and soul of the party because she had such a big personality, but in other times she was domineering and imposing. Lois longed for children right from the moment she and Harold married when she was 18. After 17 years of trying, the Jurgens had not been able to conceive a child. Harold's mother Eileen Jurgens 
didn't actually approve of the match. She tried to get her son to annul the marriage and she didn't want them to have children initially. But as time went on, the marriage lasted. It stood the test of time. So Eileen changed her mind and decided she did want them to have children. Eileen berated Lois for being unable to conceive, but it turned out that it was actually Harold who was sterile and they decided that if they couldn't conceive a child, they would adopt a child. During her 20s, Lois's behavior around control and outbursts she had in public as well as private, including hostility towards others who didn't do as she wished, including her family, caused some concern. And at one point she flashed her breast to a room full of people. She would walk around holding a crucifix, saying she was driving the devil out. Lois claimed to be a devout Catholic and she was doing God's work, but she hardly ever attended church. She complained about being tired all the time, trouble sleeping, nightmares, and digestive issues. Harold became very concerned and he got her admitted to the Mayo Clinic. During the interviews with the doctors, Lois went into detail about her abusive childhood, her relationship with Harold and her mother-in-law, that she desperately wanted children, and the need she had to keep her immediate environment clean and tidy her short fuse, and how the slightest disruption to her life made her upset and angry. The doctors noted that without treatment, Lois would go on to develop paranoid schizophrenia, but the Jurgens could not afford treatment with that the Mayo Clinic offered, so they went elsewhere, and Lois tried desperately to get help. She went to so many different doctors, and you know she had stints in psychiatric clinics. She even had electroshock treatment. It's unclear what the outcome of this was. The report from the Mayo Clinic also said this. It was, quote, fortunate that this woman has not been able to carry through pregnancy at this time as a child will only compound and complicate her emotional disturbance. She would be a poor candidate for adopting a child at this time. But the Jurgens were convinced and determined that adopting a child would actually make Lois better. This was what she wanted, and this is why she was ill. So the Jurgens went to several Catholic charities to help them adopt a child, but due to Lois's mental health issues, they denied their requests. They moved to a large home with a back garden and space for children, which was 2148 South Gardenet Drive in White Bear Lake. This was a middle-class suburban neighborhood, and certainly her in status in the farms and slums in which Lois had lived during her childhood. Lois obsessively kept the house clean, spotless, immaculate, not tolerating any dust or disorganization. Lois and Harold continued to attend their parents' weekly gatherings as well as family functions, but her presence was pretty much always laced with tension. Nobody knew how she was going to be, what version of Lois would come forth depending on who was around her, what they said, what they did, the slightest thing could set her off. She tried to be seen as the best in her family. She'd married a wealthy man. She'd married into a higher class. She was able to afford to bring her nieces and nephews presents that their parents couldn't afford because the Zoas family was poor. It was clear she was also the dominant one in the marriage. She often didn't let Harold speak. She would speak for him. She would correct him in front of people. She made no bones about it. She would tell him off and he took all of it. It seemed that he was as nervous as the rest of the Zerwals clan were of Lois's temper. Harold was clearly in a coercively controlling marriage. In most cases, domestic violence being perpetrated by men. This was the case with Lois's father. However, it seems that the roles were reversed in this situation. She was the perpetrator. Harold was the victim. She controlled where he went, what time he would be back, what he said, when he spoke. She limited his access to certain areas of the home, like what bathrooms he could and couldn't use, and he was not allowed to use his own front door. It's unclear if there was any physical violence, but Lois certainly had control over Harold. After the Jurgens' efforts to try and adopt a child via official uh, Catholic charities, they tried via the county. The county didn't decline them outright, 
but the, when they did offer the Jurgens a two-year-old boy, the Jurgens refused on the basis that they wanted to adopt a baby. The official channels, the county channels, said that there weren't a lot of Catholic babies in the system. They were also nervous given Lois's mental health history. So when this failed, they went via the private route. And on the 26th of June in 1960, the Jurgens were handed a four-day-old baby boy whom they named Robert. When the county found out that the Jurgens had gone via the private route, even though private adoptions were possible at the time, they're not now, the welfare system did get involved. They strongly opposed the adoption, but it still went ahead. They carried out the regular checks and Robert appeared to be doing well. Robert seemed to be the child that Lois always dreamed of. He was quiet, obedient, and learned to say the rosary flawlessly by the age of two. Robert had some bouts of ill health. He was physically very small for his age. He wasn't loud and leery, which suited Lois considerably. She didn't want a child that was rambunctious and disobedient. She required order and controlled her whole world, including her family, with an iron fist. Robert learned from a very young age as to how he should behave to avoid any abuse from Lois. He was heavily disciplined, but he learned quickly how to avoid these punishments. He knew he had to finish his food and not complain, not spill anything, pick up after him where he could go and could not go in the house, where he could and couldn't play. The Jurgens had the child that they wanted, but they wanted to adopt it again. They knew that private adoption would not be possible this time because the welfare department would once again oppose and the Jurgens would need approval from the official channels this time. The Jurgens applied, the normal home checks and visits took place and the officials that visited were hesitant to allow the Jurgens to adopt given Lois's history with mental health difficulties. One caseworker that interviewed the Jurgens felt uneasy about Lois. There was just something about her demeanor that her unwelcoming approach and her constant assertions of how great they were as parents and how much they love Robert seemed that she was putting on a front. However, after making a full assessment of the home, they had money, they had a stable home. The fact that Robert was doing well, the Jurgens were then officially approved to adopt another child. However, Lois and Harold did stipulate that they wanted a baby, not a toddler, and they should be white and they should be Catholic. After two weeks in the care of his mother, Dennis Craig Puckett was placed into foster care with an elderly couple called the Martins. Jerry was stripped of her parental rights on the 18th of April in 1962 and Dennis was around four and a half months old so he was officially placed into the foster care system awaiting adoption. The Martins described Dennis as being solidly built, strong for his age and had a healthy appetite. Dennis had blue eyes and blonde hair. Mrs. Martin said that he was a really nice baby. They used to call him a clown because he was always laughing. He wasn't shy, he was very active. Other officials say that he was rambunctious, fearless, into everything, the type of baby that would need an eye on him at all times and was very, very spirited. Dennis had been baptized as a Catholic, which had been on his official records. He was coming up to his first birthday when he was first introduced to the Jurgens. This was with some reluctance because he was a year old and the Jurgens wanted a baby, ideally, but there were very few Catholic babies in the system in the county. The Jurgens were hesitant to even meet Dennis because of this, but also Lois didn't like the description of Dennis's personality. They wanted a baby that was almost exactly like Robert in both looks and personality. But Lois backpedaled a little bit when the caseworker told them it's extremely unlikely that they would get a child that was a carbon copy of Robert. Lois said, well, we know they won't be exactly, but just as close as. Lois was unsure, but then she asked the question, to which the answer would decide Dennis's fate. She asked if they rejected Dennis, would they get another chance at adopting a baby? Definitive answer wasn't actually given, but they told them that that was actually a possibility. The Jurgens were shown a picture of Dennis and the caseworker could tell that Lois wasn't fully on board. She didn't look like the look of Dennis. She didn't like the description of his personality, but Nonetheless, a meeting between the Jurgens and Dennis was arranged at the Martins' house. Dennis treated the Jurgens like any other visitors. He had no fear, no shyness. He went to them straight away. 
Harold took to the little boy and was playing with him on the floor before long. The caseworker still didn't feel comfortable, but it wasn't Harold, it was Lois that was making her feel uncomfortable. Lois wasn't just cold to Dennis. She insulted him. She said he was, quote, sloppy fat, that his round belly was purple and awful looking, that his belly button stuck out. And he was big for his age. Lois was unhappy that he didn't resemble Robert as closely as she wanted. She picked at other aspects of him, and the caseworker once again warned the Jurgens that if they rejected Dennis, they would be unlikely to get a child that looked and acted just like Robert. Lois picked up on the fact that not only was Dennis, uh, you know, active and boisterous, he was big for his age, and Robert was small for his age, so he was concerned about whether Dennis would overpower the subdued and small Robert. The caseworker emphasised that these were not negatives, these were just traits, this was his personality, this is how he would be as a person. Lois made the remark that children can be trained, and she indicated that she intended to use discipline to shape and mould Dennis to how she wanted him to be. The caseworker was not happy with this, telling Lois that Dennis was much too young for any kind of discipline. On the 3rd of December in 1962, Harold called the officials to say that they wanted to take Dennis. The caseworker wanted to discuss the fact that Lois didn't appear to like the boy, but Harold was adamant. The officials were still not really happy, so they visited the Jurgens to air their concerns about Lois's negative feelings. Lois once again backpedaled and said, although there were problems, the boy needed a home, and he w she was certain that Dennis would, would eventually be able to fit in. Lois expressed that she was approaching 40, and she knew that adopting over the age of 40 would be difficult, if not impossible. The caseworker expressed again that they didn't feel that the Jurgens should take Dennis. Feeling frustrated, the caseworker said to the Jurgens, do you want to take Dennis or not? The Jurgens agreed to a week-long trial, and this occurred the day after Dennis's first birthday, and he weighed 20 pounds. Dennis was just as energetic and just as rambunctious as he was when he first met the Jurgens. Robert's environment was turned upside down as well, not just the arrival of a new child, but that this child was such a handful. Lois still complained about Dennis's weight. She said he had a lot of sloppy fat. However, the week-long trial wasn't enough. They wanted to try Dennis for a few more weeks, and they did. Dennis was even taken to the family doctor, who noticed a massive difference between Robert and Dennis. Dennis was happy, friendly, running around, playing with things, into everything. He had a healthy weight. Robert was small, frail, withdrawn, and just didn't really go anywhere. If you put him in a chair, he'd stay there. Lois mentioned to the doctor about Dennis's belly, and the doctor confirmed it was a navel hernia and not something to be worried about. A few days after the week-long trial was supposed to end, the Jurgens agreed to adopt Dennis. The caseworkers were not entirely happy. They were on the cusp of saying no, but ultimately they agreed to the adoption. After a few weeks, the caseworker visited. They were pleased with how Dennis appeared, and although he seemed to have lost a bit of weight, he was still quite stocky and healthy. For the following year, the county made several home visits for the year-long probationary period, which was customary to take place before the adoption was actually made official. Dennis was still his exuberant and happy self. He showed promise. However, during the probationary period on the 21st of August, August in 1963, an incident occurred which would foreshadow a series of very dire events. Dennis was hospitalised with severe burns to and around his penis. Her story was that she had placed Dennis in the sink with the intention of washing him after he had wet his diaper, but when she went out of the room to get a diaper, he had turned on the hot tap and had burned himself. Lois says she didn't notice at first and Dennis didn't cry, but it wasn't until later that she noticed the redness and the swelling, so she took Dennis to the hospital. Even when Lois told the caseworker about this, they weren't worried. They said it was just an accident, and Lois was behaving like the concerned mother she should be. The treating doctor suspected that Dennis may need skin grafts. That's how bad the burns were. The nurses described the injuries as grotesque. The swelling to and around his genitals was horrific. 
He needed treatment for almost a month. He stayed in hospital for almost a month. Luckily, the skin grafts weren't needed. The staff at the hospital did actually notice that Dennis had multiple bruises. The caseworker wrote the following. I called Dr. Peterson about Dennis Puckett and the doctor indicated that Dennis does have a fairly severe burn and that he probably will need some skin grafting. Dennis would probably be in the hospital at least another two weeks before they would even be able to know if he needed grafting. I asked him about Dennis's condition and emotional behaviour at the time. He said that Dennis is in no pain and is receiving whirlpool baths each day to keep the area clean. He seems to be a well-adjusted and happy child. He has not been crying or frightened. Dennis receives much attention because of his outgoing personality. When the hospital weighed Dennis, it showed he in the eight and a half months in which he'd been with the Jurgens, he'd gained only three pounds. He went from 20 pounds to 23 pounds in eight months. After the hospital stay and just before the year long probationary period was up, the caseworker visited the house and said it was as if nothing had happened. Dennis was his normal spirited self and he and Robert were playing. On the 3rd of December in 1963, the final visit before the adoption was finalised took place and the Jurgen said that they wanted to adopt again, this time preferably a girl. The Jurgens convinced the caseworkers that they loved Dennis and they didn't want to give him up. It went through and Dennis Craig Puckett became Dennis Craig Jurgens on the 11th of February in 1964. The Jurgens took Dennis to their parents' weekly family gatherings and everyone loved him. He played with his cousins and tried to join him when he could. Robert didn't and when he was offered treats by relatives, he said no. Robert obeyed his mother to the nth degree and people observed that he was probably the best behaved child they'd ever seen. Lois would try and discourage Dennis from playing with his cousins and she would try and discourage him from getting dirty or anything like that. She didn't like that type of behaviour and she really didn't like the idea of her sons getting any kind of dirt on them. Dennis in turn though would take treats offered by people but he'd get in trouble for it and Lois actually made her original description of him his nickname, Sloppy Fat. On one occasion, Dennis decided to join in with some rock and roll dancing in the living room of the Zoa's house, even though he was only two years old. But he actually danced really, really well. Everyone thought it was really cute, and they described him as having a devilish look in his eye. So when Lois called him sloppy fat, it was meant as an insult. But the family called him Dennis the Menace, purely as an endearment. They loved him. Everyone adored Dennis dancing, except Lois. When she saw what he was doing, she yanked him by the arm and left the house. Everyone was in shock with how violently and how furious she was with this boy just for dancing. Because Harold and Lois voiced that they wanted to adopt another child, there was a visit scheduled and this time there was a new caseworker. The previous one had moved out of state. The new caseworker had spoken to the previous caseworker who worked on Dennis's case, had been given some information about Lois and about Robert and about Dennis. The previous caseworker described Lois as chubby, that Dennis was well built. It was observed that when this visit took place, that Lois was very slender and Dennis was quite slight. Both of them had lost weight. However, they were both dressed very neatly, very presentable, as was Robert, almost immaculate. The house was immaculate. The caseworker wasn't really sure. She was convinced that Lois was putting on a front as being the best housewife and mother that she could be. Nobody really knew what she would be like if the pressure were to be ramped up. The caseworker spoke with her colleague and decided that one of them would be intentionally mean to Lois to see how she reacted. The caseworker made another visit and picked up on everything Lois said about Robert, about Dennis, asking her what she meant and disputing what she said almost implying that Lois was lying about how harmonious the house was. The caseworker even said to Lois that she didn't think that Lois would be a good mother. But Lois didn't bite. She didn't snap. She kept calm and appeared to show that she could withstand being pushed. In February 1965, a funeral was held for one of Lois's sisters who had died of brain cancer. Lois had trained both of her sons to recite the rosary without 
fail. They did so at the service, which was not lost on the attendees. But some had mixed feelings. Some children were jealous of the boy's ability to do this because they were much younger than them and were doing it so flawlessly. Some adults thought this was wonderful and some felt it was not right. How on earth had the boys been taught so flawlessly to recite the rosary when they were so small? But there was something odd about Dennis. Dennis was three years old and was wearing sunglasses. The service was being held indoors and he was wearing sunglasses. Over the next couple of months, White Bear Lake experienced very harsh winter blizzards and heavy downpours. It caused White Bear Lake to burst its banks. The roads became flooded and invaded some houses. This was also the case for the Jurgens house. The basement became flooded and Lois blamed her husband for not carrying out certain works in the house and the yard to prevent such occurrences. The Easter period in White Bear Lake was usually full of festive events, but the Jurgens didn't usually participate. Harold actually left the home for the weekend just before Palm Sunday to help a friend who needed electric work done in Wisconsin. So Lois was left alone with Robert and Dennis over that weekend and a storm struck the city, once again flooding the basement. Lois was once again angry at her husband for not making this basement waterproof, and she had to use a garden broom to get rid of it, so she was angry. In the morning of the 11th of April, 1965, Bob Vanderwist, who was a police officer in the White Bear Lake Police Department, received a radio from the dispatcher, Jerry Sirocco, telling him to head to 2148 South Garden at Drive. It was a DOA, dead on arrival of a child. Vanderwist knew of the Jurgens, for Lois's brother Jerome Zerwas was a high ranking police officer. He was second in command of the whole police department. He was a lieutenant. The doctor who had attended the child was Dr. Peterson, who was also Vanderwist's children's physician. And here is what Peterson told Vanderwist. At 9.15 that morning, Harold Jurgens had called Dr. Peterson, saying, I think my son is dying. Dr. Peterson arrived less than 20 minutes later, but it was too late. It was clear that the little boy was dead. The little boy was Dennis Craig Jurgens. Dennis was pronounced dead at 9.35 a.m. on the 11th of April, 1965. When Van der Wist arrived, he described the Jurgens as being upset, but he couldn't see any tears or any actual crying going on. Both Lois and Harold were pacing aimlessly and Vanderwist began his line of questioning. He asked Harold first, then Lois, what had happened. Their stories appeared to be identical. Dennis had a cold and on the previous morning he'd slipped on the floor of the basement near one of the bathrooms. They said he hit his head on a tile. Harold was in Wisconsin and when Lois called him to say that Dennis was sick, Harold came back to their home Saturday night. Harold made a number of checks on Dennis in the night and took Dennis to use the toilet at about 8 a.m. that Sunday morning. Harold sat with him and Dennis even made some remark about Harold's broken watch. Lois was next to check on Dennis and she said that Dennis appeared to have been gurgling and gasping so she then went to call for Dr. Peterson. Van der Wist only got the bare bones of the story, neither embellished nor elaborated on what they said and quite often the police will ask you to tell them more about what happened when it happened and, and what you were doing before and after but the Jurgens weren't giving much more than that. Lois did say something that Harold didn't say, which was that earlier in the week, Dennis had fallen down the basement stairs. But Van der Wist wasn't getting any more information from them, so he turned to observe little Dennis, whose body had been partially covered by Dr. Peterson. Even with only some of his body on show, Van der Wist could see that Dennis was riddled with bruises and cuts, which were clearly in various stages of healing. His face bore multiple lacerations, including a high gash on the forehead, and his nose was extremely red and bloody. Van der Wist made the observation that the skin looked like it was peeling and that just a wipe would have removed it. The boy's body was removed at 11.30 a.m. that morning, Van der Wist noticed that Dennis's arms remained rigid and refused to be lowered. They were at a kind of 45 degree angle and his fists, his hands were balled into fists. Van der Wist wasn't a coroner, but he was experienced enough to know that death that occurred around two hours prior 
wouldn't have such deep set rigor mortis. Van der Wiss tried once again for the third time to get more information out of the Jurgens, but they stuck to precisely what they said and their story didn't change. Dr. Peterson's version was that he received a call from Harold Jurgens at 9.15 a.m. saying, I think my son is dying. When Dr. Peterson arrived at the house, he could see very clearly that Dennis was deceased and there would be no way of reviving him. Jerome Zerwas, Lois's younger brother and lieutenant in the local police department, immediately showed an interest in the case. And although Jerome was questioned by Van der Wist, given he was a close relative, Jerome started to interfere and manipulate the investigation. Van der Wist made the well-known remark in this case that there were so many bruises on the boy's body that you couldn't fit a nickel in between them. Jerome later, under oath, said that in this meeting, Van der Wist only mentioned the cut on the forehead and the nose and nothing else. He vehemently denied that Lois ever struck or abused Dennis, saying the little boy had everything a toddler could wish for. Dennis was taken to the coroner's office for an immediate autopsy. The items that were removed from his body included two diapers, so he was wearing two, a pair of rubber pants, a shirt and pajamas. The bruises were systemic, running the entire length of his body. He may have fallen down the stairs, he may have got into knocks and scrapes, given how active he was, but there was nothing other than systematic and intentional beatings that could explain these boys' injuries. The coroner actually stopped counting the bruises when he got to 50 because he could see there were so many, there was no point in counting them. He said there were easily over 100 bruises. They certainly were not sustained from one single event or by close proximity of time. They were in various stages of healing and they were different colours and many overlapped. There was also a huge red injury to the base of Dennis's penis. The tip was also bruised, although it wasn't clear exactly what had caused that. Dennis was severely underweight. The coroner made the observation that the boy had no subcutaneous fat. To have no subcutaneous fat is unusual in anyone, particularly children. There were small curved cuts on the skin behind his ears. The injury to the base of his penis was also horrific, as if an old injury had been reopened repeatedly. But there were bluish colourings to the end of his penis and some on his scrotum. They were different. These were small areas of intense pressure and another detective called Korolchuk observed it was like a bite mark. This was a view shared by many others in the years to come, indicating sadistic sexual abuse. Despite all these injuries and clear malnourishment, the coroner had to find the cause of Dennis's death. Votel performed a exploratory examination of Dennis's insides and found a section in the small bowel that had perforated. This perforation caused fecal matter to spill into Dennis's abdomen. The time between the incident that caused this and Dennis's death could have been anything from just a few hours to a couple of days. The pain Dennis was in would, couldn't have been measured. Peritonitis was what caused the death, but what had caused the perforation that resulted in the peritonitis? The coroners and pathologists couldn't find an internal cause. So there was no appendicitis, there was no diverticulitis, pancreatitis, or, you know, cyst or abscess or anything like that. It had to be external blunt force trauma. But it needed more investigation, more needed to be done to determine whether or not the coroner could rule this as accidental or homicide. Van der Wist then asked the coroner if his hunch was correct, that the boy's body wouldn't have been so stiff after just a couple of hours, and the coroner agreed. Rigor mortis begins to set in at around two hours-ish after death, or sometimes it can be a bit, bit sooner than that, and it usually lasts for around 12 to 24 hours after death and then goes away. Contrary to popular belief, people believe that once rigor mortis sets in, that the body is going to remain stiff. It's actually temporary. But Dennis's body was so rigid and so stiff, they couldn't move his arms down as they were putting him into the car to take him away. This showed that he must have died much earlier. They believe that Dennis actually died within 10 hours before Harold called the doctor. 
Harold Jurgens was later questioned that evening and asked how he could account for Dennis being so horrifically bruised. Harold mentioned that Dennis had fallen down the basement stairs the day before, which Lois had told him about. However, there were so many different stages of healing that one fall could not account for all of them. There were also no broken bones and the slits behind his ears, the injury to his penis could not be accounted for by a fall down the stairs. Harold put the penile injury down to the scalding that had happened about 18 months to two years before, saying that the injury kept reopening. Harold then revealed something quite interesting. He said that Dennis didn't feel pain. He wouldn't cry, he wouldn't tell them when he'd hurt himself. He fell easily, he bruised easily. He had trouble going to the toilet and didn't know how to go to the bathroom properly. When questioned about Dennis apparently being malnourished, Harold said that Dennis ate all of his meals, but he had a problem chewing his food. He would swallow his food whole without chewing. As if that explains malnourishment. Yet these problems were never reported before, not to the doctor nor the hospital. When Harold was asked repeatedly if Dennis had been hit, kicked, punched, thrown. Harold simply answered, quote, not to my knowledge. Dr. Peterson was questioned, but he seemed quite cagey once the cause of death was made known to him. What the detectives wanted to know was roughly when the infection would have set in and his apparent rapid decline and death was plausible because Harold said he had taken Dennis to the toilet at 8 a.m. that morning and he was chatting and he was fine and then just over an hour later, he was dead. Had the injury been caused in that sort of one hour space? Had it been caused way before that and he only just started to decline quickly after then? If the Jurgens had noticed that Dennis was ill much earlier, they would have called for help surely before that. Peritonitis is an infection that can be resolved in a timely manner with antibiotics and an operation, even in the 1960s. Why did they wait? Till he was, according to Harold, dying to call for help. But much of the evidence pointed to Dennis being dead already at the point that Harold made that call. Later that night, at around 11 hours after Peterson had declared Dennis dead, the two detectives, Korolchuk and Vanderwist, went back to the Jurgens' home and took a look at the basement stairs. The bathroom that Harold had previously said that Dennis had come out of before he slipped and fell was at the bottom of the stairs, in the basement. There was no further stairs down which he could fall, so Harold didn't say anything more about it. Harold repeated that Dennis was clumsy, he was always knocking himself, he bruised easily, he didn't feel pain. The mortician in charge of preparing the body, which was Jim, who Jerry Sherwood would later go on to speak to, had a hard time covering up the bruises on Dennis's face for his funeral. The bruises penetrated the makeup. It was just so bad. He did his best, but the bruises were still there. A crown of white roses was placed over the forehead in an attempt, it looked, to conceal the very, very big gash in the middle of his forehead. With a family as large as the Zerwas and many in-laws, the detectives had a lot of interviews to conduct. But because the Jurgens were so reclusive and the boys weren't allowed or permitted to play with any of the neighborhood children, some said they saw the boys looking neat, presentable, nothing wrong. Some said that they saw Dennis with black eyes, bruises on his face and a cut lip. One reported they actually saw Lois hit Dennis so hard in the face that she gave him a bloody nose. Lois argued them away and said that they were all down to falls. Kids do fall down and some kids are clumsy, but they wouldn't result in that many bruises. One sister says she was on the phone with Lois one day when she had to excuse herself from the phone. The sister said she could hear Lois hitting Dennis in the background and the little boy crying out. She, she couldn't listen to anymore. It was distressing. The same sister, had heard from Lois that she would often clamp a clothespin on Dennis's penis and make him kneel on a broomstick handle while reciting the rosary. She was actually laughing about that. She was laughing about the fact that she didn't let Dennis remove it even after he'd finished 
reciting the rosary. The second caseworker who had interviewed Lois after the Jurgens expressed a desire to adopt a third child, she came forward. But she was met with Jerome Zawaz when she phoned the police department. Rather than the detectives in charge of the investigation, Jerome told her to back off. Jerome later said this didn't happen. And Jerome's accounts were at odds with so many other people. He would give so many conflicting accounts and even denying certain conversations took place. The detectives also staked out the Jurgen's home on occasion and observed that Jerome Zerwals was a regular visitor. Even though Jerome swore that this conversation never took place, the caseworker reported that Jerome told her the following, that Dennis had never been well and that he had very sensitive skin which bruised easily. This is congruent with what other people had said to other people in this case, so it's unlikely that the caseworker would have made this conversation up. Jerome's behaviour at the funeral also alarmed the mortician. Jerome asked if he could look behind Dennis's ears and told the mortician that when it came to covering up the bruises that the mortician had did a good job of cleaning that up. Again, Jerome denied this, but the mortician mentioned that when he was preparing the body, he didn't notice the cuts behind the ears. It wasn't until later that it was made public that there were cuts behind the ears. So why else would Jerome want to look behind the ears? The mortician had made some observations about Lois and Harold too. They didn't show any emotion. They were just blank and completely mute. No matter what the mortician said, asking to take their coats, asking if they were okay, if they would want, you know, if they want anything, it was an open casket. But they just looked at the boy and walked away. There was no tears, no emotion, and they totally ignored the mortician. Little Dennis was laid to rest on Wednesday, the 14th of April in 1965. Another attendee at the funeral was Barbara Venner, who was a childhood friend of one of Lois's nieces. As a girl, she'd been present at numerous family gatherings at the Zerwar's parents' house, and they of course happened on a weekly basis, so I don't think she was there every week, but she was there a lot. At one of these gatherings, Lois was trying to get Dennis to walk rather than crawl. He wasn't much over the age of one at this point, and every time he got down to crawl, Lois would slap him and yank him by the arm. And this went on for at least 15 to 20 minutes, and the slaps became, as Barbara put them, as blows. It was really, really bad. Nobody did anything about it. People just said it wasn't their business to interfere with how a mother parents her child. Lois battered Dennis in full view of the family and made no apologies, had no qualms about doing so. Lois was also observed telling Dennis he was so stupid and being so aggressive. But one particular event stood out to Barbara Venner. When Dennis was 18 months old, Barbara had gone to one of the Zoas' family gatherings and she saw that Lois was feeding Dennis. Except this was not a normal feeding. She had tied his hands together behind his back with a towel and was holding his mouth open while shoveling mashed potatoes into his mouth. This was done so forcefully and so much was being thrown into Dennis's mouth that he gagged and then he vomited. Lois then proceeded to feed Dennis's own vomit to him. Again, nobody said or did anything. Nobody ever reported Lois to the police. The same person said that during another conversation, Lois had unashamedly told her that if Dennis did not go to the toilet when she instructed, she would put her finger into his rectum and feed him his own feces. One of Lois's brothers saw her force feeding him horseradish as punishment for not eating his dinner. Once again, Dennis threw up and he was made to eat it. Lois had issues with her son using the potty, deciding for him when he should go. And to make him go, she would tie him to the potty until he went. At night, she tied his wrists and ankles to the bed to prevent him from getting up. She unashamedly told her family this, so this was no secret. Barbara Venner had regularly told her mother about what she observed. When Barbara told her mother that 
this had happened and uh, Lois was hitting Dennis and screaming at him, they decided to call welfare. Their details were taken, but they didn't get a call back. They were the only ones who made any level of effort, even though a small effort, to do anything about this. Some of the family, though, said to Lois, if you hate Dennis so much, why don't you just give him back? But Lois refused on the basis that she wouldn't be allowed to adopt more children if she'd given him back. She was adamant she could train the unwanted behavior out of Dennis and the good behavior into Dennis. At the funeral, family and friends were whispering, exchanging glances and looking at Lois. Many were of the view that this was an accident and didn't or refused to acknowledge anything different. But many, including Barbara, believed Dennis's death to have been a case of wrongful death at the hands of Lois Jurgens. As well as the observation she had personally made, Barbara spoke with family who said that Lois would make Dennis recite the rosary while kneeling on a broomstick. So it wasn't just her that had heard that from Lois. Lois had told other people too. She beat him if he got it wrong and made him stay kneeling on that broomstick and still have that clothespin on him until he got it right and then afterwards. Most of the abuse happened though when Harold wasn't home and when he was, he'd ignore it. He was too scared of his own wife or was he too apathetic to care? When people saw Dennis's body in the casket, many saw the bruises and made remarks about them. One actually counted six bruises she could visibly see and someone confronted Lois about the bruises. Rather than sticking to her story of him falling down the stairs or being clumsy and all of this, Lois said that the police had beaten Dennis's body up after taking him away to make it look like he had been battered by her. The detectives continued to interview family and friends. Many said that they would agree to, be give, to give sworn statements, but after a while, they refused. And there were some fears surrounding the safety of Robert in the home. On Good Friday, five days after Dennis's death, Robert was removed from the Jurgens' home. To the detective's surprise, they didn't really seem bothered. They appeared to be accepting of it right from the off. They would go and get his things. Okay, then. Harold then made a remark to Vanderwist. It was the two detectives in charge at the time, Vanderwist and Koroljuk, who had personally gone to take Robert. And Harold made a comment to Vanderwist saying he wished that Dr. Peterson had done more than just a cursory examination of Dennis's body at the home. Apparently, Dr. Peterson had only looked at the head and the arms. He remarked that Dennis's body must have been beaten and bruised after being taken away, as he didn't have all those bruises when the body was taken out. Hmm. After Robert was removed from the home, before going into foster care, he was admitted to hospital as a precautionary measure. It was observed that he was very knowledgeable and somehow obsessive about religion. He refused any sweets that were offered, saying his mother wouldn't like it. He was asked about Dennis, but Robert was only five at the time. The only thing he could say was that Dennis had died of hunger. The investigation into Dennis's death stalled. It is unclear why, but it was thought that Jerome had deliberately destroyed or altered evidence. Robert remained in foster care for three months before being relinquished into the care of Harold's mother, Eileen. Lois and Harold were forbidden by court order to have any contact with Robert, but Harold's mother allowed them to see him whenever they wanted. It was a couple of years later that Robert was actually out of his grandmother's house that the house actually caught a blaze and burned down. Harold's mother Eileen died in the inferno. It has long been speculated that Lois had been the one to set the blaze. She didn't like her mother-in-law and she had previously asked that Robert be placed with Lois's niece Bonnie rather than Harold's mother Eileen. However, there was no investigation into that to my knowledge. There was nothing conclusive, so that's only conjecture at this point, especially because Robert happened to be out of the house at the time. Although Lois and Harold didn't get Robert back straight away, Lois still got her wish. Robert went to live with Bonnie. And after 18 months, Robert was put back into the foster care system and he went to live with a lady called June Boll, who lived down the road from where the Jurgens had moved in Stillwater. Before they could even consider 
giving Robert back to the Jurgens. They had to agree to undergo psychiatric assessments, which they at first refused, but eventually relented in order to get Robert back. Lois was assessed as being very damaged due to her childhood. She had a need to control her environment, belittled her husband about his infertility. She was diagnosed with anxiety, depression, schizoid personality and neuroticism. Four and a half years after Dennis died and a lengthy custody battle, Robert was eventually returned to Lois and Harold Jurgens at the age of nine because Lois, despite her mental health issues, Robert was not in any danger, they felt, because he was getting a bit older. The foster home he was, he had been in with June Bowl was on the same street as where the Jurgens were and June, I believe she either fostered other children or she had children of her own. But Lois forbade Robert from ever contacting June or those children again. At the custody hearing though, just before Robert was returned to them, there was a lot of talk about Dennis, not just Robert. There was talk about Lois's derogatory remarks towards Dennis saying he was stupid. They didn't know why they were saddled with him. Dennis went from being a stocky, healthy weight to being thin and frail, resembling an old man, people said. Not long before his death, his spirit appeared to wane. He was no longer the happy, friendly, outgoing little boy that he once was. He even stopped crying. He was only whimpering. It was as if the fight had gone out of him. Lois maintained that Dennis couldn't feel pain, but this is not something that the doctors that were called to testify in the custody hearing could corroborate. Lois said that Dennis would even thank her for spanking him, although this to me seems more like something she told him or made him do for her own pleasure. What allowed Robert to be returned to the Jurgens was that Robert had clearly not been treated the same way as Dennis. Robert was their golden child, their favourite, the one who did everything right and he didn't need to be reprimanded as such. Only a few years prior to Dennis's death, the term battered child syndrome had only just been coined, but it was not regularly prosecuted, nor a term regularly used. After Robert was returned to the Jurgens, they decided not to stop there. They wanted to adopt more children, but they knew from what had been said before that there's no way the same agency would approve their request, so they went to a different agency than before, this time a Lutheran one. Four siblings from Kentucky, who were nine-year-old Renee, eight-year-old Grant, six-year-old Michael, and four-year-old Ricky, had been placed into the foster care system by their mother and were being looked after by a lady called Sherry Riley. Sherry was more than willing to keep the children, but she was a single woman and they wouldn't allow her to have all four of these children. And the system were very keen on keeping the children together as a unit. When Lois and Harold applied to adopt these four children, they mentioned nothing about Dennis, only Robert. However, the agency did find out about Dennis and asked the Jurgens, why didn't you tell us? The Jurgens said that they feared being judged for something that they had not been convicted of. Yeah, that seems plausible. Yeah, that's fine. The children were placed into the Jurgens' care in 1971. Robert got on well with his new siblings. He was a big brother again. He had a sister. He had three brothers. After the year's probationary period, again, like with Dennis, the caseworkers were absolutely fine. They were happy for the Jurgens to have these four kids. But not long after, things started to go wrong. The same things that happened to Robert and Dennis began to happen to these four children from Kentucky. Lois was abusive and sadistic, throwing used sanitary napkins in their faces. She once hit Grant's head against a protruding nail after picking him up by his ears. For the slightest thing, the slightest infraction she would beat them and this included going into their rooms in the middle of the night waking them up inspecting their rooms for even the tiniest bit of dust and if something small like things not quite neatly in a line she would beat them in the middle of the night as for harold the children later said that harold didn't abuse them but he didn't protect them either. He never intervened. He didn't say anything. Sometimes Lois told Harold to go and beat them, 
but he didn't want to. The way that he would do this is he would tell the children to cry out as he slapped his own leg. Rene, the oldest, had confided in Bonnie, who had at one point custody of Robert, and Bonnie's mother, Eloise, who was one of Lois's sisters, about what was happening. Eloise then went to June Boll, who also had custody of Robert for some time. They both agreed that if Rene and those children ever needed help, they could go to June Boll. A few years after these children were adopted, many of them, they just couldn't take it anymore. Robert, he'd had enough. He ran away. And at the age of 15, he was put into foster care. Rene and Grant decided one day that they would run away and they managed to find a window of opportunity to do that. Ricky and Michael were too scared of Lois to run. But apparently Lois tried to get out of them where Renee and Grant had gone and she beat them severely for not telling her. Renee and Grant went straight to June Bowl and she took them to the police station where they reported the abuse. Renee even had evidence. She had kept with her a clump of her own hair, which Lois had pulled out of her head. Lois denied the allegation. She said the children were just ungrateful and after all she'd done for them, how dare they? How dare they say these things? Said they were all lying. Sherry Riley, who had fostered the children many years before in Kentucky, she was contacted and she went to Minnesota to see the children. She had since got married and therefore was now in a position to be a mother. She wanted them back. She was happy to take them back. However, she only gained custody of Michael and Ricky, the two younger boys. Grant went to live with June Bowl, and Renee went to live with Bonnie, Lois's niece, who again was once Robert's foster carer. The siblings had been split up, but at least they were now safe from Lois. Lois and Harold's parental rights were stripped. They were not allowed to adopt any more children. So out of the six children they had adopted, one had died, one had ran away, and the other four themselves had run away and been taken away. So there they were, childless. After Jerry Sherwood had this conversation with Lois in which she was promised some mementos of Dennis and didn't receive them, she put it to one side for a little bit, as I said earlier. But after a few years, it just, it just played on her mind. So she decided once and for all that she would get justice for her little boy, Dennis. The two police officers who were going to be speaking to Jerry that day were called Ron Meehan and Clarence Buzz Harvey. So we just call them Meehan and Buzz. Both had actually been on the force at the time of Dennis's death, but claimed not to remember much about it. Although they later relented and said, yeah, we did know a bit about it. They appeared not to want to talk about it or said they just didn't remember certain things. And it later came out that Jerome Zerwas, who was at one point a lieutenant there, had previously said to people at the station to just leave it, almost intimidated people. Some statements were made, but people refused to sign them. And it later came out that Lois had been making threatening calls and sent threatening letters to members of her own family, threatening to kill them and their little bastard children if they testified against her. Vanderwiss also swore on oath that Jerome had once told him that he would be willing to protect his sister at all costs, even if it meant his job. And again, Jerome said that never took place. Buzz Harvey looked through the file. The file seemed incomplete as if someone had just stopped. Dennis McIntyre Jr., so Jerry's second son, Dennis, called the police on the 15th of September, 1986. He was noticeably upset and angry. He wanted to speak with the detectives with his mother, Jerry Sherwood, and the meeting took place on the 18th of September, 1986. Dennis McIntyre Jr. arrived at the station with his sister, Misty, and their mother, Jerry Sherwood, who at the time was 42 years old. Jerry told the detectives her story right from the beginning. She was reluctantly handed the original police file and the officers told her it might be best if they read it to her. Buzz read the original report from Vanderwist. Dennis was laying on his back in the crib with his head facing west and his feet pointing east. His arms were towards the east or alongside of his body with his hands about eight inches off the bed. There were covers partly on Dennis. They were about up to the middle of the body. Dennis had many black and blue spots or bruises on his face, 
head and arms. The rest of his body was covered up. On his face and forehead, there were at least a dozen black and blue places. Some were very large and others small. His nose was almost red and peeling. Although distressed and crying, Jerry insisted on being told the whole story. She needed to know exactly what happened to her son, however painful that would be for her. She vowed to never let this drop, boldly saying she would be in regular contact, so they'd be hearing from her very soon if they didn't take action. Ron Meehan put this in the case of the county attorney. He drove to the office the next day, meeting with the chief of the criminal division called Jim Conan. Jerry and Dennis McIntyre Jr. had already been to Jim Conan, so Conan knew to expect the police. After receiving the file, Jim Conan was as shocked as the officers, and he placed the file in the hands of the county attorney so that this could be prosecuted. Just as she had promised, Jerry Sherwood remained in contact. She was badgering them and pushing them for information. She was like a raging fire. After just two weeks of the meeting with Meehan and Buzz, Jerry went to the Ramsey County office and met with a medical examiner there by the name of Michael McGee. McGee's role for the county attorney was to perform autopsies and determine cause of death. Jerry wanted to see the coroner's file, but a court order was needed to see it because she had relinquished her parental rights, so therefore had no right to see it. Understandably, Jerry was unhappy with this, so she stormed out. But the person with whom she was speaking, the chief assistant, Jim Essling, he couldn't let go of how passionate and upset she was, so he himself took a look at the file. And there was something that fell out that caught his eye. It was an inventory of the items of clothing that Dennis was wearing. Two diapers, a pair of rubber pants, one shirt and pyjamas. Essling then realised what had made him go into the file because something just was ringing a bell other than Jerry's impassioned speech. Essling had been the one to write the list and he saw his signature from 21 years ago. Essling read the file and saw that it didn't provide a conclusion to the autopsy. It described a three and a half year old white male child covered in bruises and cuts, uh, were in various stages of healing. There was a very obvious cut on his penis and the cause of death was found to be peritonitis as a result of a ruptured bowel. In the section of the report that required it to be noted whether it was an accident, suicide, homicide or natural causes, it was noted as deferred. Deferred is when a ruling cannot be determined without more information. So technically, it's still open. The coroner had recorded this at the time because he couldn't be certain as to what had actually caused the perforation. Personally, he did feel this was a homicide, but he couldn't make the determination without more information from the police. The coroner received no more information from the police, so it was never changed from deferred. Essling took the file to McGee and he only had to glance at the file and he said, this was not an accident, this was homicide. The coroner's report confirming death due to homicide was key to reopening the case and having the murderer prosecuted. McGee demanded all the reports, he wanted everything that the police had, and he also spoke to Dr. Votel, who had since retired, about the autopsy that he performed. Votel remembered the case, and he said, yes, I did think that this was a homicide, but he needed more information. He couldn't do it off a hunch. He needed to know. The police report also referred to photographs, but there were none actually in the file. During McGee's hunt for the photos, which took a while and it took several reports, it came to light that there was another file in the system. The file was about the custody hearing of Robert Jurgens. Like Jerry Sherwood, McGee would need to see a court order to see the photographs. And McGee was actually able to get them the very same day he made the inquiry. He was absolutely sure that this was a homicide, but again, he needed the information. There were six photographs and they were all of the boy on the autopsy table. No photographs of the scene at home were taken. McGee could see that he was a very thin little boy. His belly was distended. He was covered in cuts and bruises. A massive gash to his forehead. His nose was just huge and red and bloody and just horrible. And a very obvious cut on the base of his penis. McGee was shocked. And he likened the appearance of Dennis's body to someone who'd been tortured and beaten repeatedly with a baseball bat. It also showed Dennis's arms, which were 
bent at a kind of 45 degree angle, as I said before, and his hands were balled into fists. McGee's professional opinion was that Dennis had died around 10 hours prior to the photos being taken, but it was clear that Dennis was not lying down when he died. Why would his arms be up here? Why would they be staying in that position? He believed that Dennis did not die in his crib. He died somewhere else and was placed in his crib. On the 7th of October in 1986, Dennis Jurgen's death was ruled a homicide. As a result of the review of the above noted records, including the coroner's file number 30001, autopsy photographs and reports from White Bear Lake Police Department, it is my impression that this case represents a homicide. As a result, I have filed an affidavit to amend the case and manner of death in the case of Dennis Jurgens. The amended immediate cause of death will be listed as peritonitis due to perforation of small bowel due to multiple traumatic injuries consistent with battered child syndrome. Under other significant conditions will be listed multiple soft tissue contusions, abrasions and injuries. The manner of death will be listed as homicide. However, this was not quick enough for Jerry. She wanted action. She wanted action now. She spoke with Jim Essling again, and he put her in touch with a man called Brian Bonner, who actually reported for the St. Paul Pioneer Press Dispatch. So he was a reporter. Bonner obtained all he could from Jerry about her story and even visited the people that still lived in South Gardenet Drive. He also tracked down Lois and Harold Jurgens at their new house, but he couldn't get an answer at the door. So he got hold of the Jurgens' home number. Lois answered Bonner's call, and after exchanging initial conversations, he revealed to Lois that 21 years after Dennis's death, his death has now been ruled a homicide. Lois feigned astonishment and surprise at this, and Bonner told her that Jerry Sherwood, Dennis's birth mother, was the one to bring this about. Bonner asked Lois about whether Dennis's peritonitis had been caused by the fall down the basement stairs, but Lois refused to speak to him, saying she wanted to speak to her lawyer. Brian published the story on the 12th of October in 1986. It featured a picture of Jerry and her son by Dennis's grave. It mentioned Jerry by name, but it didn't mention Dennis Jurgen's name nor Harold or Lois Jurgen's. Legally, they couldn't do that. But a lot of people who read the article knew what this was about. Quotes from the article came from the first coroner of hotel, current coroner McGee, and from some investigating officers as well as from Jerry. Jerry's words were fierce. She said, the killer is going to pay. Somebody's going to pay for my son's death. The article didn't make its way into the ethos. It wasn't forgotten. By today's standards, if this was on the internet, it would have gone viral. It was featured on radio, on television, and although the Jurgens could not be named, people in White Bear Lake that knew about Dennis had an idea that this was to do with him. It prompted people close to the case to come forward and tell the police what they'd seen, what they'd heard, and what they knew all those years ago. It normally takes a long time for a case to be prosecuted, especially a homicide case of this magnitude and from so many years back, but Jerry Sherwood was impatient and demanded it be done as soon as possible. Like I said, she was like a raging fire. And her attorneys, even though they had no experience in homicide cases, they were just as passionate as she was about getting justice for Dennis Jurgens. The attorneys were Mindy and Clayton, and Mindy herself had been adopted. And Mindy, at that point, had married, and she'd had a little boy who was just Dennis's age at this point. Robert Jurgens was now 26 years old, and he was actually now a police officer. After being placed in foster care, he rebelled. He turned to drugs to deal with his problems, but he put himself in rehab. He got himself clean, turned his life around, and got a career in the force. At the age of 21, he got married, and he and his wife welcomed a little boy into the world who, at this time, was just three and a half years old. Robert was interviewed just prior to the grand jury trial. He said something quite revealing. What Harold said about Dennis on the toilet chatting with his father in the morning that he died. Harold said that Dennis was talking about his broken watch. Robert said that did happen. Harold did take Dennis to the toilet, they did talk about the broken watch because Robert saw them go there, Robert heard them speak, but Robert said this conversation took place the night before. 
not the morning of. Robert had been in bed at the time of this conversation. He'd been asleep for a bit and it had woken him up. He then saw Harold take Dennis back to bed. Robert went back to sleep. It wasn't until the following morning he awoke to screams coming from Dennis's room. He didn't know if the screams were coming from his mother or his brother. But when he went in, he saw his mother standing over Dennis's crib. She was whacking him really hard on the back, yelling at him, but he was limp like a rag doll. His head was just lulling back. And it went on for ages. His mother didn't even try and shove Robert out of the room or say anything to him. But eventually she gave up and put him back into the crib. Dennis was making no sound at all. Robert then went down into the living room and waited. The doctor and the police turn up. Dennis was taken out. He was gone. Two more incidents stuck out in Robert's mind and he was sure that they happened the day before or very close to that before Dennis died. One was that in the basement, Robert could hear Lois cursing at Dennis and she was holding him from behind the ears and dunking his head under the water in the sink. Robert also recalled the raging storm that happened the night before Dennis was pronounced dead and he said he was riding his trike on that night in the basement and he heard a repeated thumping noise. Dennis was falling down the basement stairs. He didn't see how Dennis ended up falling down the stairs, but in hindsight, it didn't seem to be like a trip. Dennis appeared to be flying down the stairs. His mother went running after him. Dennis had hit the floor and he hit the floor on his stomach. Lois had ran after him. She picked him up from the floor. She was slapping him, kicking him, shouting at him. Dennis was crying and whimpering. When presented with pictures of Dennis's autopsy photos, Robert barely had a reaction. He said that Dennis always looked like that, so it wasn't much of a shock to him. Robert was torn between his loyalty to his parents and his duty both as a brother and a police officer. Although his relationship with his mother was bad as a child and he'd ran away, it had greatly improved since he got himself clean from drugs and their relationship was really, really good now. He trusted his parents enough to leave his own son with his parents for three weeks while he and his wife moved house. He commented that many of his memories had been suppressed due to trauma passage of time, but after hearing more and more, memories started to come flooding back. Abuse that he had experienced at the hands of his mother, being beaten with a belt and with a spoon. Robert actually paid a visit to his parents and he tried to get more information from them, but they told him pretty much the same thing they'd been repeating all these years. They couldn't tell him anymore. Jerry Sherwood received word that Lois was up to her old tricks and was threatening people to keep quiet and not to testify. Again, Robert Jurgens was struggling with his conscience, but he ultimately made up his mind he would testify against his own mother. Mindy, one of the prosecuting attorneys, contacted Michael McGee and said that they really needed to go one step further. She wanted to exhume Dennis's body and get definitive proof of what caused his death. Michael McGee was dubious, saying, a body's been in the ground for 22 years. And he made the comment that what they would be examining would be soup. However, the mortician who had prepared Dennis's body said the opposite. He said the body wouldn't have rotted because what they would normally do is remove the entrails, which is where the rot normally starts from the inside out. They would put them into bags and put the bags at the bottom of the casket. Lack of oxygen would also mean the amount of rot would be quite minimal. When the body was exhumed, McGee was astonished that little Dennis's body was pretty well preserved. His skin is shriveled and it looked kind of purplish in places, but the scars and injuries to his body were still there. Even the bruises were still there. The massive cut on his forehead, the slits behind his ears, the pulverized nose, the injury to his penis. The marks behind the ears were reminiscent of fingernails. And that was consistent with what Robert said about Dennis being held by his ears by his mother. The injury to his penis was still evident and it looked as if it had been a deliberate tearing of the little boy's skin. The entrails were in a bag, as the mortician had explained, and they were pretty well preserved too. McGee was able to find the specific part of the small bowel that had ruptured. After completing his examination, McGee concluded that the ruptured bowel must have been from a blow either to the front or to the back, but it was a huge blow. 
and it was quoted as being train wreck force. A fall down the stairs, it wouldn't have caused this. The small bowel had been torn from a blow that forced the bowel against the spine. Little Dennis must have been either lying down or up against, standing up against a hard surface and a blow delivered to him, which forced the bowel against the spine, which tore it. Lois Jurgens was indicted by grand jury in January 1987. Although Harold's actions or inactions were indeed culpable, any statute of limitation for any offences allowing this to happen or being an accessory to homicide had passed. Harold did try and take some of the blame from Lois, even trying to say he had given Dennis a smack a few days before he died, but this was news to the prosecution and it wasn't consistent with what the autopsy revealed, so... Harold Jurgens was therefore not charged with anything. Lois was charged with one count of second degree murder and two counts of third degree murder. First degree was not introduced because that implies homicide with both intention and premeditation. Second degree is homicide with intention without premeditation. And third degree is similar to manslaughter, an injury inflicted that caused death but without intention. Lois pleaded not guilty to all three of these charges and the case went to trial. Many family members and friends were called to testify, including professionals who had seen what happened to Dennis. Some said they decided all those years ago not to go ahead with signing their statements or not to go ahead with testifying, either out of loyalty to Lois or because they were scared of Lois. There were questions about why was this not prosecuted all those years ago? And many officers actually said in the trial that Jerome Zerwos was the reason they didn't. He used his position, he pulled rank to intimidate people. He interfered and inserted himself into the investigation. Jerry Sherwood was present throughout the entire trial and at one point, both mothers locked eyes and Jerry said that there was definite hatred going back and forth between them, although more so from Jerry. Lois was subjected to psychiatric evaluation. She didn't take the stand in her own defense, but she did answer accusations put to her during the psychiatric evaluation. And she basically accused her whole family and anyone else who was talking against her of lying, being drunk, um, all kinds of things. Lois's defense attorney had a very strange strategy. He admitted his client was a bad mother. He agreed that she battered and abused Dennis and she should never have adopted him or any other children. This is not a defense of murder, but it doesn't prove murder. The attorney actually wanted the second degree murder charge dismissed because to be guilty of second degree murder, you have to have intentionally caused the injury to kill, but without premeditation. This was clearly not the case here, he felt. He wanted the two third degree murder charges also dismissed, saying that they, tan they were basically tantamount to manslaughter and the statute of limitations for manslaughter had, had gone. But these were counts of third degree murder, not manslaughter, so his request was denied. Mindy gave the opening statements and she passed pictures of Dennis around both before and after he died. The jury were very deeply affected by these images and other people were as well and at one point it was shown to the whole court and Jerry Sherwood had to leave the room. The witness that would be the most powerful in this case was Robert Jurgens. He took the stand on the 20th of May in 1987, shortly before he would turn 27 years old. Robert was asked about his life both before and after Dennis arrived. He said beforehand he was lonely and afraid and Dennis was happy when he arrived, so it was good to have a playmate. Robert described how Lois dunked Dennis's head under the water, digging her nails into his skin behind the ears. Around the time of Dennis's death, Robert recalled seeing Dennis fly down the stairs, as he described it, and he landed at the bottom on his front. Lois chased him, grabbed him, hollering, shouting. Dennis was crying. He then remembered waking up in the night, hearing Dennis and his father talking. Dennis was on the toilet. His father was talking to him. Dennis made a comment about his broken watch. Then Robert went back to sleep. But in the morning, he heard the screams. He saw his mother picking up and shaking Dennis. She was thumping him hard on the back before putting him back down into the crib and calling for Harold. Robert was asked if there was any difference between his relationship with Lois and Dennis's relationship with Lois. Robert said that he couldn't really explain why, but he did cherish his mother even though he was frightened of her. He did whatever she said. He ate what he was given. He did what he was told. He picked up after himself. He kept himself neat. But Dennis did not. 
he was a bit more disobedient. So he would receive harsher reprimands. And when asked why he has come forward to talk about this, Robert said the following, I have always wondered and never had any answers. And after he passed away, I didn't have a brother anymore. And I think I owe it to him. After a harsh cross-examination by the defence, the defence asked Robert a question that the prosecution wanted to ask, but they were forbidden by law from doing so. The defence asked, You think your mother caused Dennis's death, don't you? After a moment of silence, Robert returned one word. Yes. The defence didn't call any witnesses, nor did they provide any evidence to support their plea. In the defence's closing arguments, they said that despite how awful a mother Lois was, and it was clear that Dennis was abused, this was not a trial for child abuse. This was a trial for murder. And the defence truly fully believed that the jury would not be convinced that there was evidence in this case that Lois caused the injury that resulted in Dennis's death. The jury was out and delivered a verdict on the 5th of June in 1987. The jury found Lois Jurgens not guilty of the charge of murder in the second degree. Jerry began to break down, thinking that she'd failed, but then it was confirmed that they did find Lois guilty of the charge of murder in the third degree. Jerry was elated as were her four children. Jerry remarked, Denny can now rest in peace. Lois Jurgens was sentenced to 25 years under the law of 1965 when the offence was committed, a minimum to be served of eight years. Lois was paroled after just her minimum of eight years for good behaviour. Mm. And guess what? Harold took her back. He stood by his wife. He was distressed as she was convicted and sentenced. While she was in prison, she did appeal, but that appeal was denied. But the behaviour that put her in prison wasn't enough to make her stay for 25 years. Eight years for good behaviour. Except the behaviour that put her there was truly abysmal and appalling. Jerry was furious that this woman got out after eight years. She felt that it just wasn't enough. You know, she felt that even though there's nothing more that she could do, this was all that she could hope for. Sadistic behaviour put Lois Jurgens behind bars and good behaviour since, even though there were no children there to abuse, got her released. The Jurgens stayed together until Harold died in the year 2000. There was speculation that Lois had poisoned him, but his autopsy showed no sign of poisoning and he was in failing health, so natural causes was recorded. Wouldn't put it past her. Lois Jurgens died in 2013 at the age of 88. Good fucking riddance. It's unclear as to how or where Jerry Sherwood is now, or if she's still living. One source says she had died, but this has not been substantiated. My heart goes out to Jerry, her children, the people that tried to help and were threatened, and Robert Jurgens particularly. He's lost his whole family now and he lost so many people. He'd been through an awful lot. I'm pleased that he didn't meet the same fate as Dennis, but he's having to live with all of those scars. And most of all, my heart goes out to the sweet, rambunctious, defenseless little boy, Dennis. I hope Lois's eight years in prison dragged. I hope they were fucking hell for her. I hope the rest of her life was hell. I'm normally very sympathetic to people who have been abused, but once an abused becomes an abuser, that sympathy goes out the window. Harold is just as guilty from a moral standpoint, even if not from a law standpoint. A lot of people have said that this was a case of folly adieu, madness of two, that Lois was clearly psychotic and that she had such an influence over Harold. I don't care now whether Harold was a victim of coercive control or domestic violence. I appreciate that people in those situations find it very difficult, sometimes if impossible, to leave a relationship. And I don't like it when people say, why don't you leave? However, as soon as anyone, even your own spouse, starts to abuse the children, their lives are way more important than your own. You put them first. Even if you don't leave your other half, you get the children out of that difficult position. You save them, and you certainly don't cover for your spouse. The pair of them can just rot in shit for all I care. And I really hope 
that the surviving children as well, Renee, Grant, Michael and Ricky, went on to have great lives. I'm sorry they were separated, but at least they were safe from Lois. Rest in peace, little angel, Dennis Craig.